Good morning, everyone. Uh, bright and early at eight o'clock South African time. Um, welcome to the 2022 um, student symposiums. Um, I look forward to a day full of um, the students presenting the work that they're doing. Um, the whole concept behind this is to one, to get them familiar with presenting, but two, um, a space for them to, to learn from the questions and um, that come from their, their work and any constructive uh, input that you may have. Please feel free to contact either the supervisors or the students regarding any projects if you've got some ideas or um, constructive input to provide. Um, I really do wish the students well in terms of um, their presentations today um, and um, look forward to, to all the different various um, exciting aspects, not to mention the esteemed guests that we have um, that will be introduced um, during their, their sessions. Uh, very nice to have a, um, the opportunity um, that I think um, an online streaming event provides um, in terms of having international guests as well. Um, a key thing here, folks, is we will have to be um, we will have to be patient if we have load shedding issues. We've got stage five in many parts of the country. Um, and I think in the Eastern Cape, we also got stage five. Um, so we may run into to, to problems there, but we're just gonna have to deal with it as South Africans always do, we find a way. So um, good luck to the students um, and handing over to, I think, Nikki. Welcome everyone. <clears throat> so um, I'm Nikki, I'm the um, leader of the Seascapes Research Group which is organizing the symposium today. So before I introduce our first um, guest speaker, um, I've just got some, some house rules for you. Please can all attendees stay muted during the, the symposium and to ask a question at the end of the presentation, can you please raise your hand or you can use the chat function to ask questions. Please can you vote via SurveyMonkey for the, um, the best MSc um, and PhD talk. You're only allowed one vote per category. Um, the link to the survey will be shared in the chat and vo voting will close at the end of the last talk. So today for our first, uh, our first speaker, we're very privileged to have distinguished Professor Janine Adams. Professor Adams holds the Saatchi Chair for Shallow Marine Ecosystems, and she's the Deputy Director of the Institute for Coastal and Marine Research at Nelson Mandela University. Professor Adams has published over 200 scientific papers, as well as numerous books, um, book chapters and reports. She has graduated an incredible 40 MSc students and 24 PhD students. Her research focuses on conservation and management of estuaries. And through extensive networking and collaboration, she successfully links science, policy and management. Today, Professor Adams is going to tell us about this work, focusing on the restoration and management of South African estuaries. Professor Adams, over to you. Thank you very much, Nikki. It's a great privilege to be here today. Um, I have a long history of working with people from SIAB, so it's a really a privilege to take part in the student symposium today. So I'm gonna give a little bit on our research and um, the theme I've chosen is catchment to coast because of course the research done at SIAB is from freshwater into marine systems. And then with a specific focus on estuaries, because estuaries are the meeting place of the land and the sea. And I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to the type of research that we're starting to do on restoration. And so I will give a background on estuary characteristics, then going into some specific pressures, being environmental flow reduction, water quality changes, restoration, and some concluding remarks. And throughout the talk, I might address this, what we call a double whammy, and that is that estuaries are at the pressure for interface of climate change and also increasing human pressures. So as researchers, we ask the question, are we beyond tipping points or thresholds of concern? And we ask what chance is there for restoration? Can, can we actually implement restoration and have some success? So we'll look at some of the case studies on this. So estuaries, as I'm sure we all know, they're complex, dynamic and productive systems. And in South Africa, over 75% of our estuaries close to the sea. So we have 290 estuaries occurring along wave-dominated coasts. They're microtidal, they're small, and they're shallow. 
And because of our coastline, they're characterized by unique biodiversity. So we're so very lucky to have this outdoor laboratory stretching from our drier west coast down to our warm temperate, cool temperate, warm temperate, subtropical into our tropical zones. And estuaries, as we know, they're very important. They have a lot of different ecosystem services, um, all shown on this figure. I won't go into all of them now. But something that we're doing a lot of research on lately is carbon storage and sequestration, because globally this has become very important for climate change mitigation. But that's notwithstanding that all the different ecosystem services are equally important. So in South Africa, we have this diversity of estuary types, providing lots of opportunities for comparative research. Estuaries that are close to the sea, estuaries that are permanently open, estuarine lakes, bays and river mouths are all the different types that give us co comparative opportunities in terms of our research. We also, in our country, we have a blueprint for the management of South Africa's estuaries. And this came through the Integrated Coastal Management Act that says that each estuary in the country, it needs an estuary management plan. And the estuary management protocol, just some points here shown from it, it guides how we should manage estuaries in the country. So we con should conserve, manage and enhance we should maintain or restore ecological integrity. We should manage cooperatively, which is, can be quite a challenge. We must protect a representative sample of estuaries, promote awareness, education and training, and then minimize the potential detrimental impacts of climate change. So our work working across the Science Policy Practice Forum, this is a very exciting space that I've always enjoyed working in. And so we've worked closely with Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment on making sure that estuary management plans are implemented throughout the country and providing input on an estuary by estuary cases. On any good day or in any good week, we will have a number of phone calls or emails asking for input on this. We've also worked consistently on the National Biodiversity Assessment, which is implemented as part of the National Biodiversity Act. And um, that takes place every five years in the country. And then starting from many years ago, um, the implementation of the National Water Act that said each estuary has a specific, it recognizes that each estuary needs fresh water to keep it in a healthy state. So as scientists and researchers, we provided that information on how much, how much water does an estuary need to keep it in an ecological functioning state in one that provides the ecosystem services that we're dependent on. This is just showing an output from the National Biodiversity Assessment. And so we have a, a rating of our estuaries from unmodified in an A category all the way to an F to an extremely degraded category. And we can see how these estuaries in the different states are distributed across the country. This also provides a blueprint for restoration because it tells us where the impacts and the pressures are and where attention is needed to improve the estuary. What are the major threats or pressures on our systems? We are, we are a semi-arid dry country, so one of the major pressures is changes in freshwater inflow. And because of that, often you have changes in the mouth conditions, so artificial breaching of estuary mouths occurs. There's a national deterioration in water quality, not only in estuaries, but all aquatic bodies, biological invasions and resource utilization. So when we restore estuaries, these are the type of pressures that we have to mitigate. I'm not going to speak too much about our climate change research today, but we are doing very exciting work on that, particularly working on the East Coast and the change in the distribution of mangroves along the coast. I'm going to speak more on the, um, on the human pressure. So going now on to reduction in freshwater inflow. How does this look around the country? Um, and we can see that total freshwater inflow has decreased by 40% for the 20 largest catchments. So this is water that no longer gets into the estuaries, that no longer gets into the coastal environment. And we can see from high, medium and low there that of course the greatest pressures are in our urban environments. We've also, through our research, shown that estuaries are very sensitive to small changes in base flow. Here on the Alecrowell's estuary, there was just a small farm dam that was constructed. And as a result of that, the mouth closed to the sea for the first time. And that's because even a small change in base flow, like 0 0.03 um, cubic meters per second, the mouth will close to the sea. And now we've changed the characteristics of that system from a permanently open to a closed estuary. 
So we have an understanding of changes in freshwater inflow in terms of base flow, floods, what is needed to keep the estuary in a functional state. This was a case study on the Gamtus estuary. The Gamtus is just outside uh, my, my city. It's uh, a permanently open estuary. In 1949, it closed to the sea, but then 2018, it closed again. And if you go up and drive around in the catchment, you will see extensive agriculture there, particularly citrus. There's major freshwater abstraction, and so this contributed to mouth closure. The mouth closed, it was adaptive management in action. Fortunately, I was out of town at that time, but the mouth had to be artificially breached when um, the cows started floating around in the fields. And uh, my colleague, Tris Woolridge, then with the authorities, they made the decision to open the mouth to the sea. But that gave us a nice opportunity to research, like what is the future in terms of our permanently open estuaries? If they close, start closing to the sea, how quickly will they then um, go back to their permanently open state with salinity and temperature gradients? And so this figure shows in the A state, sort of the profiles of the estuary under the closed state, in B when it was breached, and then C when it opened again. And we were able to show that salinity and other gradients they established within one month. So the mouth was closed, it was then artificially breached, and within a month, because of the strong tidal dynamics and tidal flow, the estuary opened again and re-established its salinity and primary productivity gradients. Um, that's just a little bit on uh, permanently open estuaries closing to the sea, but also we understand the effect of mouth closure on our sensitive habitats, particularly mangroves. Mangroves grow in intertidal habitats. Uh, they, are, they tolerate fluctuating water level conditions, but they do not like to be permanently submerged. So when the mouth of an estuary closed to the sea, the water level can still rise in the estuary, flooding the mangroves, and flooding the pneumatophores, the air roots, and resulting in dieback. And this is what happened to one of our Eastern Cape estuaries. The mangroves died. That area in the bottom right figure, where you can see where the mangroves died, it was soon replaced by salt marsh, as this figure also shows. And even today, the mangroves haven't re-established in that estuary. So it's a good study site of ours. We do long-term monitoring there to try and understand now are, is the salt marsh outcompete in the mangroves and will we ever get mangroves back into that estuary? It's now open to the sea again and um, this estuary did close to the sea when there was a drought and there was freshwater abstraction, illegal freshwater abstraction and there was also a large sea storm that deposited sediment in the mouth and closed it to the sea. So now it's once again tidal but does not have mangroves in it anymore to any large extent. So what have we done about this? We've worked closely on environmental flow requirements with Department of Water Affairs, and we have methods to say how we should determine environmental flows for estuaries. And we've applied this method to more than 50% of South Africa's estuaries. And so we've had some successes. So the environmental water requirement studies have prevented the issuing of further licenses in stress catchments. And they've also provided knowledge and outputs that have used in other legislation requirements, such as often environmental flow requirement study, there was a lot of information on the present ecological status of an estuary, and this has been then incorporated into the National Biodiversity Assessment and Estuary Management Plans. But there's been some drastic failures, and one of them is a study we're working on this year, which is a certification of a Ramsar estuarine lake. This is on the west coast. This is the Falurin Flay. It's an estuarine lake that connects to the sea, um, not permanently, but periodically. Um, but now, being in a drought situation, the lake has dried up and it now occurs in three different distinct compartments, an upper reach, reed and sedge compartment, a little bit of water left in the main lake, and a very dry section near the mouth. And when we went um, sampling there last year, we all went out, three different teams of scientists. We came back at supper time and we all thought our instruments were malfunctioning. But each one of us, we measured a pH of around three in the main estuary body. So this lake has become acidified and it is a, it is a national failure because licenses are still issued for water use in the catchment. And it's completely over extraction of fresh surface water as well as both groundwater that has now led to the state. Um, it's the first estuarine lake in the country. This is a process that's recorded in a lot of dry Australian systems. But here's the first time we've found acid sulfate um, sediments, as shown in these figures here. 
one can ask what would it take to restore this lake and we don't really know maybe a big flood that certainly it's more water under this dry acid condition you need more water in the system and then um, moving on to uh, water quality as a major pressure there's been national deterioration in water quality but if we look at some of our actual management measures there What's allowed to come out of a wastewater treatment plant? Um, so people would get licenses to discharge wastewater. And that's at 21 milligrams per litre of DIN and 10 milligrams per litre of DIP. And we've showed in our research that that already causes downstream eutrophication. So we even have a problem with some of our permitting um, ranges. We see an increase in fish kills in our estuaries. So about 10% of estuaries, all estuaries have fish kills. There's a proliferation of invasive alien plants that we're starting to do research on. And then there's microalgal blooms, such as seen on the bottom photo, that's Heterosigma in the Swakops estuary, where we've never recorded it before, it only was ever in the Sunday's estuary. So this is all the responses of the primary producers to nutrient enrichment. And then even our most important estuary in the country from biodiversity conservation measure, the Neisner estuary is also has experienced eutrophication. This was once again failure of a wastewater treatment works and uh, raw sewage went into the Ashney channel and uh, the, one of the primary producers, a very thin macroalgae that takes up nutrients very fast and grows very quickly, seen here, water lettuce, lettuce ulva, it um, grew throughout the marsh and the locals were saying, oh, we need to get rid of this toilet paper because it, it dries out into this thin papery form. That wasn't quite close to the truth because it was the wastewater that was causing this eutrophication. But one of the biggest threats there is that we have the endangered um, seagrass, eelgrass, Zostra capensis. And when you have these macroalgal blooms, they can cover the entire seagrass area leading to dieback. So this, this is eutrophication is an increasing threat in all of our estuaries. So this um, table just shows um, some of the work we've done on the Swatkops estuary. And last year we had a, a workshop on the environmental flow requirements and future scenarios of what the SWAT corps might look like. So those are different scenarios across the top. Uh, we had the present status in 2021. What does the estuary look like? What would it look like in with future climate change scenarios where there might be an increase in flooding? And scenario two was another worst case scenario where there might be a 60% increase in wastewater. And we based that on population growth for the catchment. Scenario three, four and five, we looked at restoration scenarios, decreasing the wastewater input, restoring habitat, what would happen to the estuary. And here, and this point to be made here is, are we beyond tipping points and thresholds of concern? Because this study showed that to improve the ecological category or present ecological status of the estuary from a D, uh, um, a highly degraded system to a C, a moderately modified system, we would have to take all the wastewater out of the estuary as well as restore habitat. So that's a lot of intervention just to improve the class up to one category. Um, so, so are we beyond tipping points? Yes, we can. And we've got case studies of how we can improve health. But sometimes we have this double whammy. Also with climate change, we're going to have an increase in temperature and harmful algal blooms and macroalgae will grow um, rapidly under those conditions. So now on to the more positive part, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. We're in the UN Decade. It's this global call for action. It's ecosystem restoration for people, nature, and climate. It looks at ecosystem-based approaches, um, addressing various societal challenges so that we can improve human well-being and biodiversity as our endpoints. And restoration, I'm finding it a very exciting space to work in because it's a positive message. We can do something. We can improve estuary health. We can improve catchment to coast management. And we need to celebrate the restoration successes that we have had. We need to uh, celebrate our conservation successes. This ignites hope. It inspires the next generation of thinkers and change makers. And there's some of the hashtags associated with that ash, at ocean optimism notion. So what have we done? Is there, are there any examples of restoration in South Africa? And I like to use the Orange River mouth as a case study because there was a road, a causeway that was built from the small town all the way down to the mouth. 
and it separated the main channel that was delivering the fresh water to this large salt marsh area here. And so, of course, the restoration action or intervention is fairly simple. Remove the causeway, allow the tide and the fresh water to come into the area, and you would get salt marsh reappearing as in this top picture. And this was what we call a passive restoration. You didn't need to go out and plant plants in that area. The salt marsh seeds were distributed by the water, by the tidal flow, and you soon got a salt marsh appearing. But now, of course, we're advocating that the entire causeway is removed. So this dry, desertified and very saline habitat is connected to the main channel again. And by restoring this tidal connectivity to the desiccated and saline marshes, it improves multiple ecosystem services, such as carbon storage. It enhances nutrient removal, provides support to fisheries through increased biodiversity and nursery habitats. And then working on urban estuaries. So urban estuaries are those that we've modified. We've changed the way they function uh, due to inputs, wastewater input, or just due to development. This is the Zandvlei near Musenberg in Cape Town. And you can see the urban edge, highly developed system. It's also got a big marina in the lower reaches. And so we've completely transformed the system away from its natural or its reference condition. So that provides opportunities to manage the system as a novel ecosystem. We can manage it for certain ecosystem services. And here, the city of Cape Town, they keep the mouth open to the sea so that there's tidal exchange and so that water quality is maintained, so that a certain water level is maintained for the various recreational activities that the people enjoy. And so our research showed that this management interaction is having a positive influence of the estuary. The mouth is open, water quality is improved. On the x-axis here, we have time and the lower estuary, the main basin and the marina. And over time, because of this management action, the salinity has increased in the system. And um, this bottom row of figures shows phytoplankton biomass. This estuary used to be characterized by a really nasty, harmful algal bloom, paramecium parvum, and this would cause ma major fish kills when it was in the system. But once the system, the estuary became more flush, the paramecium blooms, they declined in abundance. So that's a management intervention that has improved the ecological health of the estuary in an urban system. And something exciting we've been working on in the Swatkops estuary is uh, the salt pans um, and re restoration of these. What happened in, um, and we can look at this bottom left figure here, this is the middle reaches of the Swatkops estuary. This is the Motherwell Canal here. And these are the, this has been managed by Sarah Bos. It was, a, it was a viable economic activity until the pumps became non-functioning and there was a lot of money that had to be spent on security because people were stealing the pumps. And so Sarah Bos decided to no longer keep these pans functioning and um, water was no longer pumped into there. So they, so they dried out very rapidly. And we've been then the intervention, the restoration intervention has been to divert Motherwell Canal water, which is a large stormwater um, canal, into these pans so that they are no longer in a desiccated state. And this was a win win situation because Motherwell Canal, as you can see in this top left picture, it flows all the time. Where uh, stormwater, sometimes raw sewage coming into the system, our research has shown that it's a major source of nitrogen. Uh, it drains about 14 different stormwater drains. And so this was then diverted into the dry hypersaline bare pans. And um, this was an opportunity to restore habitat and improve water quality. And um, it was the delivery of multiple ecosystem services at relatively low cost. So on the top right, there is a picture of what the pan looked like in its desiccated state. And on the bottom is um, the pan, what it looks like when it has water in it. Lots of birds have returned to the area. And this filamentous green algae, it grows and it takes up all the nutrients coming from the stormwater canal. So this has been a restoration intervention to ensure the delivery of multiple ecosystem services. Birds being one of the most important. We worked with Paul Martin on this project and he's been doing the quack counts here. He has a 30 year data set. So we were able to show in these data that the Red House salt pan and the Barnan salt pan, this was the change in the number of birds and the number of species over time. 
And in 2018, 2020, when those pans dried out, of course, it was no longer a suitable habitat for birds. But then this is Sadika Benjamin's um, honors pro uh, project that has just been um, uh, handed in. She was supervised by Gavin and Paul and myself. And here this is showing number of bird species over time. When these pans dried down, there was obviously a rapid decrease. And then this one pan, the red house pans were filled with the storm water versus the barn and pans that haven't been filled. So you can see this rapid increase once there has been filling of the pans in bird numbers and species. However, we're calling for these to still remain in a, a, a saline state because birds and the diversity of birds is all about habitat diversity. Not only are there ecological benefits, but also cultural benefits. These sites are used for baptisms and cleansing ceremonies and water quality poses a risk to human health. We've started a new research collaboration with our Faculty of Health on campus, trying to look at these links between human health and what we're doing with polluted waters, how this is influencing people. And then when we do restoration, it must be considered as a socio-ecological system. It's the ecological health. In this case, it was the salt pan state. By having a healthy ecosystem, we have important ecosystem services that are delivered. In this case, it was an improvement in carbon storage, aquatic habitat for water birds, there's stormwater filtering, there's cultural benefits, and this then leads to various societal benefits. So any restoration activity also must follow a strategic adaptive management cycle where you implement an action, you monitor it, and then you decide whether you need to uh, revise your objectives. Okay, restoration with the other research we're doing on water quality, and this is what a chemist who works in our group, is on persistent organic pollutants. These are toxins that shouldn't be in the environment. They synthesize toxins, they herbicides and pesticides. And so water quality is not just nutrients, which we focus a lot of our research on, but it's also these toxins, as well as bacterial pollution, which I haven't spoken about. And we need to restore all of those components. Now, another exciting restoration focus that we have is that of rest restoring our blue carbon ecosystems. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this term, the original term blue, blue carbon, it refers to seagrass, salt marsh and mangroves. And we are fortunate in our country, we've been monitoring the extent of these habitats in our estuaries for many years, so that we can now do a blue carbon assessment. We know where these habitats are, and we know where restoration can take place. Why such an interest? Well, blue carbon habitats, because they are inundated, a lot of carbon is stored in the anoxic sediment environment. If this is exposed, it's released. And so we can mitigate for climate change by protecting or restoring our blue carbon habitats. And so we've done a national assessment to show for our salt marshes, where are the biggest salt marshes in the country, where we can restore habitat through restoration. And that's shown in that table there. It's the Berg, the Olifants, both on the west coast, the Choritz and the Kleinbrack estuary. And what can we restore in the Berg? It's salt, pine, salt pan habitat uh, uh, again, as, as well as in the Olifants. And then it's large agricultural areas. And how? What is the main way of restoring those areas? Many of these areas have been cut off from normal tidal exchange or from fresh water. So uh, uh, often it is just a matter of removing some uh, agricultural walls, some sea walls, or um, opening up a weir or a small farm dam. And we hope in the future that there will be a lot more attention on um, restoring salt marsh habitats. Um, the interest is there. It's just to work with a variety of different types of disciplines to ensure that there is implementation. But we've provided this outline now of where one can prioritize and focus and get the best um, output for restoration. Then we've also know for our mangroves where restoration can take place. And unfortunately, a natural limitation is the topography of our estuaries. They mostly, there's very little intertidal area they drowned river basins, they've got very steep sides. So with climate change and sea level rise, we're flooding the lower intertidal zone. And we often have coastal squeeze then, just due to natural topography or due to um, coastal development. And this figure shows here where active restoration could take place. But here you see very small areas of mangroves that could be um, improved. 
and this would need to be take away some rather difficult pressures such as cattle browsing and human trampling and harvesting of trees which takes place in all these estuaries. Uh, fortunately we have growth of mangroves in the southern um, parts of the Eastern Cape due to increases in temperature and also some people planted mangroves for example at Mahoon Estuary. So we have an understanding of salt marsh and mangrove restoration. And so I hope some of these examples have shown you that um, science, we can we use our science-based knowledge for practical management interventions, whether it's on environmental flows of estuaries or estuary management plans, or now moving into restoration. And um, we need to be able to measure improvement though when we speak about restoration. And we have the means of doing this for estuaries because we've applied our estuarine health index on many occasions to show ecological health, now to link to societal benefits. And so restoration should always be considered as a complex socio-ecological system. And then maybe I don't give too much detail on it, but obviously you can't just restore the downstream estuary. You have to look at the catchment and what's happening in there. And the recent flooding and changes in water quality in the KwaZulu-Natal estuaries is a good example of this. Um, without restoring uh, the catchment, there's no hope of restoring the downstream estuary. And then uh, lastly, the restoration and management of blue carbon ecosystems. There's lots of opportunities there now. There's global interest in this topic, and this is nature-based solutions to mitigate global climate change. So yes, there is a brighter future for our estuaries, particularly for researchers in our country. We've got this diverse range of estuary types that provides many research opportunities. And we've got methods and approaches to be used for management of estuaries. We work very closely with our management authorities. And of course, all of you today, we've got wonderful postgraduate students and new cohorts of young scientists to ensure that our research continues to flourish and that we can inform management. And then not everybody likes to be a transdisciplinary scientist, but to tackle issues such as restoration, we do need a transdisciplinary approach. This is working with stakeholders and communities, a multidisciplinary approach, working with engineers and business studies and hydrology. We have a new collaboration this year with um, UCT Engineering uh, because they we've been doing uh, implementation of sustainable drainage systems in Swakops and our Ecological students have been working with the engineering students, which is a nice collaboration. So I'll put the slide up here to encourage all of those you to get involved in these action research type studies where you interact with other disciplines. Then I'd like to end by just thanking my funders. Um, I'm funded through a research chair through DSI and OAF, and then the Water Research Commission also remains an important funder. And all the research I've presented today is part of my different research groups and teams over the years. So I acknowledge their inputs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janine, for that um, really interesting talk with a positive message. Um, I will ask to get the questions underway. So um, my question is um, in Durban, beyond restoring the sewage treatment works, what, what is it gonna take to to restore those estuarine systems? Yes, I think that that's a good question, Nikki, because I think some of those are, you know, they sort of in an EF state and, and we, we, we're not going to be able to restore some of those urban systems. We can keep them in a functional, healthy state in terms of water quality, but we're never going to be able to take away the bridges and the highways and that sort of development. So, so we have to accept nationally, which we do, that some of our estuaries are in a degraded state and we put our efforts into those that aren't yet in a degraded state and when we can restore and manage. So in the Tull, north and south of Durban, we have a lot of small estuaries in highly degraded states. But if we go up further into northern KwaZulu-Natal, that's where some of our biggest estuarine area is found at St. Lucia and Umkabizaleni and Cozy Bay. We've just come back from doing a survey up there. Those are still estuaries that are still in a healthy functional state. So nationally, our efforts should go into maintaining that, which, which that said, it's not easy. But if you gave me a small KwaZulu-Natal estuary and you said, okay, restore and improve, what I would do is take out all the sugarcane and put back the riparian vegetation um, and then try and maintain water quality. Also look at the mouth dynamics and try and maintain that. Because many of the small KZN estuaries, they're now fresh, they're closed for most of the time, and they're completely hypertrophic. They, some of them are 
completely covered with invasive alien aquatic plants now. Does that help? Thanks, Janine. Um, I'm just looking for questions in the participants and in the chat. Has nobody got questions to ask Janine? Carla's got her hand up. Okay. Hi, Janine. Hello, Carla. I'm going to put my video on. Hi. Thanks so much for speaking to us today. It's been amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you briefly mentioned uh, climate change, mm -hmm. uh, although your talk did focus on other human pressures. And I realize this is probably quite a complex discussion to go into, but um, I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion on the mo what are the most immediate threats to estuaries? And do some of these sometimes outweigh the other climate change pressures faced by estuaries, for example? And, and if these more immediate threats are to be prioritized, how do we go about doing that when we're acting to restore systems? Because most of these things are always interlinked in some way. So that makes it quite difficult to, to yeah. act. But that's a very, thank you, thank you, Carla. That's a very important question. So when, when, you, when one does plans for restoration, you need to put into those plans your climate change scenarios. Um, what is going to happen in terms of rainfall, sea, sea level rise, sea storms. Um, you ask what is the most uh, immediate threat? We, and I'm just thinking, so my, my discipline is botany. We work on estuarine habitats, salt marsh, seagrass, and mangroves. And what we, the increase in sea storms is quite visible at some of our estuaries. So with Nikki, we have a paper on the Mbashi estuary, and there a sea storm came in, it deposited sediment into the mangrove habitats, the mangroves are smothered and they die back. So that, that's a natural process, that if it starts happening more frequently, we'll have sediment deposition in the mouths of our estuaries and possibly looking at more estuary mouth closure. And then changes in rainfall patterns is something we're already seeing on the west coast, and that results in salinization of the salt marshes, and the salt marshes then become very patchy. Um, and of course, that's exacerbated by freshwater abstraction. So um, sea storms, uh, reductions and changes in rainfall patterns are all big things. Um, we, we've got an article on salt marsh erosion at the Breeder Estuary, and there we looked at changes in, in wind. Just a small change in wind can, cha can cause a major change in your wave height, which then can result in erosion. So something we're not maybe always looking at in detail, our wind patterns, changes in wave height, starts eroding the edge of a salt marsh, and at the Bria de Estuary, the locals, they want us to yeah, come and do something, but there's nothing you can do. It's a natural process. The salt marsh is going to erode. So yeah, those are some of the, the climate change pressures that we see in our research. And then um, our work's also looking at um, mangrove expansion down, down the coast, and we've done some modeling and um, fieldwork studies on that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Janine. Angus? Oh, I'm in a different part of the room. Um, Janine, so we live in a country that's got some major socioeconomic issues um, and budgets are, are thin. So I'm just thinking, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, that you know, maybe we're getting fixated about a few of the systems that are in a, in a bad state. But I think from the, the, the recent flooding and KZN experience, mm -hmm. um, should we not be we putting our efforts into, into the upstream management and those type of aspects. In other words, the ticking time bombs. Yep. Um, you, you know, so we, we're putting a lot of effort into sort of the known cases, the sequoias, the oranges, you, you know, some of those. But yet we've got a major potential calamity that we will not potential. We saw it with the, with the KZN floods um, mm -hmm. in terms of upstream infrastructure, well, the lack the poor upstream infrastructure and planning. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, so 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 definitely. I mean, it is you have to look upstream, and you can't. You, I wouldn't go downstream into any small case in an estuary and do some active restoration there without having a catchment to coast approach. So there's some very good work that's done by Ground Truth in the Mgeni catchment, and you measure the you mentioned the socioeconomic economic challenges in our country. And one of the slides that I didn't put up today, because a different audience, is for restoration, I often put up my blue economy slide, which shows that for restoration, we can actually do a lot of job creation. And Umgeni, what they did there with lotto money, for, for every kilometer of the river, 
they employed a, a, a river monitor, a person, to say when there were sewage spills and, uh, you know, just to, to, to give the alarm when there were changes in activities upstream that could cause downstream problems. But a lot of what you're also addressing is infrastructure. And, um, you know, you, you're not going to remove infrastructure out of a catchment. But what we can do with more nature-based solutions is certainly uh, retain water in artificial wetlands. And this is what we've been working on, on sustainable um, urban drainage systems, is to capture water before it gets into our aquatic system and just to slow down that transport and movement of water. Um, yeah, so re restoration of riparian zones is very important for flood management, even in an urbanized environment. Anywhere in KZN you can drive and you can see that the, the from yeah, even the two meter zone inland, it's been completely urbanized. So that creates flooding and infrastructure and water quality problems. So I don't know if that's answered you. Um, Angus, you say the ticking time bombs. Yes, we have ticking time bombs, but they can you can actually turn that around into, okay, this is a restoration challenge. This is a catchment that we can work on. And what's very nice about it is you can take uh, jobs and skills right down to the local level to improve catchments. And Mgeni is an example where they've done that. Uh, there's some nice things happening in the Western Cape as well in the Breda catchment. And then I think there's a big Tugela uh, research project now with some international funding also looking at restoration and catchment to coast approaches. So we've got some examples of this happening in the country. And we should be tapping into um, big global climate change restoration type funding to do this, more action research on the ground. You know, it's, it's, it's that nexus between estuarine ecology, socioeconomic and settlement pressures and communities really living in the wrong areas. Um, with with the lack of proper infrastructure, you know, which all works fine, and until we have a deluge like we had um, last year. But then the floods are good because they reset our boundaries and they make they make people remember you shouldn't be living in a floodplain. Uh, you know, I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that happened at the Zimbali Lakes. I don't know if you saw on the Zimbali Lakes got completely flooded away. Um, KZN floods. So we're going to make this nice recreational area next to the estuary, and the floods put put uh, put that to bed. That's a good idea. Because <laughs> was it a floodplain? Yeah. So I like Thanks. floods. Uh, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, an, an excellent talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. I'm just looking for other. I think that's it for the questions. Unless I'm missing something, Carla. If I missed any. I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any raised hands. Thank you so much, Janine, for such an interesting talk and for inspiring our students. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Okay, so next, I'm going to hand over to Nabuklet, who will be chairing our um, first session, which we're going to start slightly early. Um, next, sorry to disrupt. I think we've decided we are going to rather stick to our schedule. Um, just in okay. case outside attendees are joining for specific talks, we don't want to change the schedule at this point. So um, we'll just wait Coffee a few break. minutes and then Nobukle will, will take over at 8.53. Brilliant. Okay. So we can go and get some coffee quickly. Very quickly, yes.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Nobu Lembanza, and I'll be chairing the Freshwater Ecology and Biodiversity Session. So during the session, you will hear from an amazing group of young researchers who are doing innovative research with the aim of ensuring sustainable use of aquatic resources, quantifying invasive species impact and distribution in freshwater ecosystems in an effort to preserve native biota and manage inv invasive species. You also hear a lot of um, water related parasites um, research and how we can better quantify their impacts on vulnerable local communities. And for the session, our first speaker is Martin Leroux. Good morning. I will be presenting a brief summary of my current master's thesis on Dijinian trematodiversity in vectors transmitting schizosomiasis within Southern Africa. Freshwater gastropods have great ecological importance in their role as primary consumers, forming part of the basis of the food chain. They also act as a source to many terrestrial and aquatic biota, such as fish and birds, Freshwater snails are regarded as reliable indicators of ecological status of the system because of their sensitivity to changes in temperature and water chemistry, such as increases in salinity and nutrients. Many are also good indicators of habitat suitability and diversity because they rely on aquatic macrophytes for shelter. Aquatic plants are also good areas for algal growth, which is an important food source to many mollusks. Molluscan species function as an important intermediate host for a range of parasitic trematodes that are reliant on molluscan species to complete their life cycle. Dijinian trematode parasitic infections that require the presence of a specific molluscan species may have an economical, human and animal health implication for the local area where it is endemic. Therefore, historically, trematode parasitic distribution has been established by tracking the distribution of the intermediate molluscan host. This is still one of the main methods of tracking areas of high schizosomiasis risk, as indicated on the map of Bolinas and Bionfilaria distributions collected by the Cop et al. Endemic smell species have shown a sensitivity to the presence of invasive species that compete with them for the same ecological niche. Many molluscan species are more successful than their NATO counterparts because they are more resistant to the changes in environmental conditions and can reproduce at a higher rate. And in many cases, they have no predation pressure or parasitic infections. That being said, the present status of endemic freshwater snail species and their associated parasitic infections in South Africa is regarded as an understudied field with the last assessment of the distribution and status of endemic freshwater snail species was conducted in the Lowfeld ecoregion during the 1960s and 1980s. There is thus a need to research the current status of endemic snails in South Africa. 
The first aim of this study was to assess the current distribution of freshwater snail species in historically important sites of South Africa by collecting all snail specimens from sites selected from the NWU snail bar database of species collected between the 1960s and 1980s. The second aim was to determine the potential impact of biotic and abiotic factors on snail species diversity and abundance. To do this, a qualitative habitat assessment was conducted at each of the selected sites and water samples collected for laboratory analysis. As the focus of the larger study is the assessment of the current distribution of vectors transmitting schizostomyces in the low-felt ecoregion of Southern Africa, sites were selected based on the historic distribution of schizosomyces vectors highlighted in gray on the map. Sampling sites for my study were based in the northern parts of South Africa, specifically the Lofeld ecoregion. A total of 35 sites were selected in the Limpopo River catchment and Sikwi Flay Nature Reserve and sampled during April 2021, August 2021, and February 2022. Sites indicated in red were sampled during what we termed the high flow period and sites indicated with black icons sampled during the low flow period. A brief overview of the materials and methods used. Firstly, site selection was done based on access and historical data available. Water samples were then collected for further analysis as well as in-situ readings taken and habitat was assessed. Snail species collected by hand picking of substrate or with a standard snail sampler or SASnet. Species were then identified and euthanized in the field and tissue samples were taken for molecular analysis. Samples were inspected for signs of parasitic infection. Data analysis was conducted to determine snail species diversity and potential effects of abiotic factors on their distribution. Molecular identification of species was done by using the 28S, ITS and co one genes to support the identification of molluscan species as well as their associated parasitic infection. Endemic snail species collected were identified to be members of Bulinus africanus, Bulinus depressus, Bulinus globosus, Eumphaloria fifery, Radix natalensis, Melanoides tuberculata, and Geralis connelli. Invasive species collected were identified to be members of Vicella acuta, Sidious succinia culminella, and Terebia granifera. Terebia was not historically collected within the study area. Data analysis indicated that there was a clear difference between sites sampled in the high flow compared to those sampled in the low flow in terms of their snail diversity and abundance. This was because a total of three species from three different genera were collected during the high flow sampling, with two of these being invasive, namely Vicella acuta and Terebia canifera, with the second found in high abundance, indicated with red on the graph, and only one of the collected species regarded as endemic, namely Melanoides tuberculata, while a much higher diversity of species was found during the low flow surveys, with nine species from seven genera collected, of which three were invasive, namely Vicella acuta, Terebia granifera, and Sudius succinia pulmonella. The CCA indicated a clear separation between the sites sampled during the high flow season compared to those sampled during the low flow season as a result of differences in both snail diversity and abiotic factors. The number of species collected during high flow was likely less as a result of the lack of suitable habitat during the high flow period. High flow sites generally had less vegetation and more gravel and boulders present while sites sampled during the low flow had more vegetation than algae present. Vegetation is important to snails, not only for attachment, but for areas to deposit their eggs, while algae acts as an important food source to many snails. Many endemic snails are sensitive to flow velocity, and fast flow during the high flow service likely prevented snails from remaining attached to substrates, thus washing them away. Water quality also played a role as there was a clear difference in water quality between the two surveys. Temperature, conductivity, O2 saturation and nitrates were significantly higher in the high flow, while phosphates were significantly lower in the low flow period. Many snail species 
particularly endemic species, are sensitive to alterations in water variables such as salinity and oxygen content, which likely negatively affected these species at site samples in the high flow surveys. In contrast, Terribia is much more resilient to changes in water quality, including increases in salinity, as they are able to live in high saline environments. If the presence or absence of the invasive terribia is used as the determining factor, the data indicates a distinct separation between the sites where terribia was found and the sites where terribia was absent. The presence of this invasive species clearly has a substantial effect on the endemic species, regardless of the habitat availability and seasonal flow rate. This is supported by the fact that sites 12 and 13 were the only two sites sampled during the low flow season where Terribia was present and grouped more with the, all of the high flow sites where Terribia was present during the high flow sampling, while the low flow sites where Terribia was absent grouped together. This is key evidence that the presence of the invasive species, especially that of Terribia hanifera, plays a large role in determining the presence or absence of other freshwater snail species. During this study, no scarial shedding was observed in any of the collected specimens. Parasitic species found in endemic molluscan species included Petasiga virus spinosus, collected from Bolinus tropicus, Urducadium bacteroides, collected from Radix natalensis, and new Fabricola smithy, collected from Bolinus depressus. No trematodes belonging to the schizosoma genus were found through scarial shedding or molecular analysis of the snail tissue. No parasitic insections were also found in any of the invasive molluscan species. The reduction of endemic species is concerning from an ecological perspective, since the removal of endemic species can have severely negative bottom-up effects on the food web of an ecosystem and leads to a loss of biodiversity of native species. The invasive freshwater snail species, Terubia hanifera, does not have any natural predator. It can reproduce by replicating itself, and the hardness of its shell makes it an unappealing food source for predators. Without intervention, this invasive species has the potential to completely replace all endemic freshwater snail species in the low flow ecoregion. However, the loss of endemic species may also have positive effects. To date, no parasitic infections have been found in Terribia in South Africa, and thus it is not a vector for any digenium parasites, including those that cause schizosomiasis, whereas endemic species such as Bolinus and Bionfilaria are vectors for this disease, therefore eliminating trematodes with complex life cycles that are intermediate host specific. Thank you, Martin. Um, Martin, can you please unmute yourself so that if there's questions for you, I can just read them out. Or um, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A. Guys, please, if you have any questions, please just send them in the Q and A, and the chairs will read them out to the speakers for you. Um, that was that was that was a very nice presentation, Martin. I'm just interested to know in terms of your method of shedding. What were your snails placed in? Oh, good morning, everyone. Can can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so we used uh, distilled water um, to um, to uh, let it be different from uh, the river water to put some pressure on the snails and and um, make them stress a bit to to uh, let the scaria, um escape that uh, sometimes this carrier feels like the snail is being under under pressure and it, it it wants to escape to find a new host that's more relaxed so we use distilled water and then we use intervals of four hours during the day and four hours during the night so after they've been shedded under light they get placed four hours back in in a dark container to relax and, and calm down okay thank you um, and did you see any differences in terms of parasite load between the high flow and low flow? And I might have missed this in your presentation, but I'm just I'm just interested in that in that part. If there were any differences in parasite load between your high flow sites and your low um, flow sites. So we we found more um, presence within the snail tissue during the low flow um, because of the 
um, larger range of um, different species collected, but it's difficult to um, assess the parasitic load because there was no um, shedding of Zuccaria by the snail, so we couldn't really count individual snails. So we handpicked 10 samples from each site, the, the larger snails, and did molecular on them. So it's it's not accurate to, to determine the parasitic load. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I don't it's see any questions in the chats for you. So I think we'll move on to our next speaker. And yeah. our next speaker yeah. is Feleng Letaila. Taila, and I will be presenting on the historical and seasonal distribution of schistosomiasis transmitting vectors in the Mpumalanga province. Schistosomiasis is a parasitic disease that is prevalent in more than 78 countries around the world, with most of these people found inhabiting the southern part of uh, southern Africa. This disease accounts for 10% of the global disease strain caused by the water associated of by the water associated disease group. In sub-Saharan Africa, cystosomiasis is an endemic disease that is transmitted by intermediate host snails. This has put 40% of the South African population with people living in settings that have poor sanitary facilities having the highest infection. The spatial, and, the spatial and temporal focal distribution and transmission of schistosomiasis is largely restricted by the presence of these vectors in the freshwater bodies and human contact with these water ecosystems. There are different environmental and climatic factors that influence the abundance of intermediate host nodes. The diagram below uh, proposed by Adegaya et al. 2019 shows some of these factors that have been known to influence the distribution of schistosomiasis vectors, with these factors having a significant impact on the lifespan and fertility rate of both the snails and worm transmission during the schistosome life cycle. The Mpumalanga province is located on the eastern side of southern Africa and has been labeled as an endemic area with the eastern parts of the province labeled as high risk as seen on the map on the right. There is a lack of studies that have been conducted at, at local scale in South Africa and across the world in general. And there's a major gap in studies focusing on climate change the effects of climate change on schistosomiasis. Mapping the historical distribution of schistosomiasis will assist in developing control strategies that are fitted for each local community. The aim of the study was to understand the spatial and seasonal distribution of schistosomiasis vectors, Mulinus globosus, and Biomphalaria vectori in the Mpumalanga province over a period of 40 years. To achieve this, three objectives were developed, and in this presentation, we will be looking at two. For my research, I, I looked at two local municipalities that are loca located at the Sanzeni district, located in the Pumalanga province, as these were fall under the eastern parts, which are labeled as high risk. The objective of the study was to determine the historical distribution of schistosomiasis transmitting snails. And this was done by making use of uh, spe a special distribution, a special distribution modeling technique, um, maximum entropy, which will be called maximum from England. The maximum, the maximum entropy was chosen for this study as it has been recently applied to vector borne diseases. Um, around the world. Firstly, the data collection process. The data that was used was 
from the National Freshwater Snake Collection or the NFSC of South Africa for a period of 40 years. Two snails were chosen for this study, which is the Valhalla FSA and the Bulinas proboscis. The climatic and bioclimatic, the climatic variables were from era five and the bioclimatic variables were collected from wet claim, wet climate. A PC analysis was conducted to determine the variables from both climatic and bioclimatic variables that are highly correlated to the snail data. And these were inputted into, into the Maxent model, the, both the climatic and the climatic variables. Elevation was inputted as well to determine which of these variables affected the distribution of the snails. And lastly, to evaluate the model, a jackknife method was used. To achieve the second objective, different statistical methods were used. First, the physical chemical driver assessment or the PIA, which assigned the score and ecological category to determine river quality for each site. Descriptive statistics were also conducted. And lastly, the principal component analysis or the PCA to support the PAI was conducted, which was used to determine water quality parameters over the three years. The modeling results of Mascent uh, in the form of uh, suitability maps for Bolinas, Proposas, and Bamfer Fairy show that the, so there is high suitability with the, along the borders of the two local municipalities, with Bamfer Fairy being found along more the, the river sides and Bolinas proposals was more spread out into more areas on the northern parts of the Bombela local municipality. Both species by 13 had the highest, was the highest contributing variable with surface runoff being the least contributing variable for Bamfalera fair fairy. PAI for the rivers showed that there was modification of the river systems except for the Sabi River from the 1970s to 2009, with the Komati rivers remaining moderately modified over the three decades. The changes within the Sabi River were not uh, severe compared to the other rivers, as expectedly so as the river falls through a protected area, the Kuga National Park. Due to the Kokoto River being surrounded by intense agricultural activities and is overused, one of the most overused rivers in South Africa, there were high changes of water quality parameters, especially in the 2000s. This is for gap in Komati were almost similar with water parameters degrading from the 1970s and the gap continuing to degrade into the 2000s. This may have been due to the increasing pine trees that are, have surrounded the, the river system. What has been found so far is that high species occurrence occurs along the borders of the two local municipalities with different distribution patterns for both snail species due to habitat stability. High salinity pH and nutrients levels within the four river system were found during the period of 1999 to 2009. It is important to determine historic spatial distribution of the vectors and water quality impacts, as this will help predicting current and future patterns of vector diseases such as histosomasis. This will make it easier to manage uh, changes within aquatic ecosystems and limit disease vectors, and also aid in developing control strategies within the local municipalities. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder, everyone, 
our, our Q&A is open. You, you, it's either you raise your hand and we unmute you, you ask your question live, or you can ask your question in the chat and then we just read it out for you. So the speakers have already spoken. Please go through the chats because um, there's some questions that are coming up now for people who have already spoken and you can directly answer the questions there. Um, does anyone have a question for Feleng? I'm not seeing anything again in the chat. Okay, if, if that's the case, we will move on to, thank you. Thank you, Feeling. That was a, that was a nice presentation. Um, okay, thank there's you. a question, sorry. There's a, there's, there's, there's a question that just popped in from Godfrey. Um, what sorts of management strategies would you suggest to minimize the disease factors? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so this is an ongoing study. I haven't really looked into the management strategies, but it would be definitely be part of my recommendation at the end of my um, master's. Okay, thank you. All the best. Um, and then now we'll move Thank on you. to our next speaker, which is Nawa Nawa. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to my presentation. My name is Nawa Nawa. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Zoology and Entomology, Rhodes University. I am supervised by Professor Ryan Wasserman. The title of my presentation today is edge core invasion dynamics of the Australian red crow crayfish, also known as the Cherax quadricinatus on the Barros floodplain of the Upper Zambezi system. The ability to rapidly expand invasion range is one of the key attributes of successful invasion. Freshwater crayfish are among the most successful invaders due to their ability to adapt to a wide range of environmental conditions. According to a recent review, a total of nine crayfish species have been introduced on the African continent, five of which have established feral population, and these include Cherax, Taxanias, Procambarus kalaki, Estecas, and Procambarus viginalis. The, the review further indicates that the red crow crayfish, Chirax quadricinatus, is widely distributed in Southern Africa with world population uh, reported in countries such as Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Iswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. In Zambia, the red crow crayfish was introduced on the Kafue Flats and the Barossi Floodplain. On the Barossi Floodplain, the red crow crayfish was introduced in the year 2012. As of the year 2019, the population of crayfish was still confined to the central section of the Barossi Floodplain in and, in and around the point of introduction. Despite these introductions, no studies so far have been undertaken to understand the edge core invasion dynamics of red crow crayfish on the Barossa floodplain or indeed any other aquatic system in the world. Building on previous works, this study therefore hypothesized that one crayfish has spread from the invasion uh, edge earlier established in 2019 crayfish relative abundance would be higher at the core. Sex ratio would be different between the invasion core and age population. Crayfish at the edge would be larger in size and have better body condition. To investigate the hypothesis, a total of 48 sites were sampled across three distributional regions, which are the core, intermediate, and edge on the Barossa floodplain. 
using proma traps, a wide range of aquatic habitats such as rivers, canals, and ponds were sampled. Sampling was done in both wet and the dry season. For every trapping session, crayfish caught were counted, sexed, and weighed in grams using an electronic scale. Morphometric traits such as claw length and width, carapace length and width, total length were also measured using a digital caliper and recorded. To analyze data collected, Chi-square tests were used to analyze detection probability and sex ratio. Generalized additive model was used to analyze catch per unit effort. Generalized linear model was used to analyze body size and the body condition. Results showed that as hypothesized, red crow crayfish has spread much further from the invasion uh, from the former invasion edges established in 2019. Crayfish was detected 114 kilometers downstream and 94 kilometers upstream, which equates to a spread rate of 54 kilometers per year and for seven kilometers per year, respectively. Detection probability was higher at the invasion core and intermediate range. The high detection um, probability at the core was due to high relative abundance as evidenced by high catch per unit effort of 1.5 individual, individuals per trap per night compared to 0 0.027 at the edges. Relative abundance was also significantly higher in dry season with an average catch per unit effort of 0.8 individuals per trap per night compared to 0.3 in wet season. Both dry and wet season CPUE declined significantly as distance increased from the point of introduction. Male to female sex ratio was not significantly different across the invasion regions. The results imply that both male and female are contributing to range expansion. The absence of intersex individual at the invasion edges indicate that they do not contribute directly to range expansion. Results on body size showed that both male and female individuals increased in size towards the invasion edge, while that of intersex individuals decreased. On the other hand, the season seemed to have a significant main effect on all sexes, where they got bigger in wet season. Results on body condition indicated that male and female body condition was significantly better at the core than at the edges. Season did not have a significant main effect on body condition, except that of males, where body condition was better in wet season. Results on both body size and body condition imply that older, weaker individuals are moving the invasion edges on the Barossi pathway. Based on the findings, we can conclude that Rapid range expansion exhibited by red crow crayfish is evidence of its high invasive capacity. Conspecific competition arising from high crayfish abundance at the core is the main driver of range expansion of red crow crayfish. Seasonality does contribute to tra uh, trade variability of red crow crayfish across the Barossi flatplain. The study therefore shows extent of trends in population characteristics of an invader that reflects a dynamic nonlinear aquatic system. These findings have important implication on management and conservation of wetlands such as the such as uh, floodplains.
I would like to end my presentation by giving thanks to my supervisors, Professor Ryan Wasserman and Dr. Bruce uh, Elenda. I would also like to thank the co-authors, Dr. Josie South, Dr. Josephine Pegg, and Dr. Takudzwa Mazranzira. Last but not the least, I would like to thank my funders, the Research Chair in Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology, South Africa Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity and National Research Fund, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Zambia. We have come to the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you for being in attendance. Thank you. That was, that was a very nice and clear presentation, easy to follow. Um, there's a few questions for now. First one is from Anthony um, Bernard. Um, the question is, why was this species introduced and what measures do you think should be in place to reduce the chance for future introductions of alien invasive species? So uh, just mute yourself now and answer that for me. Thank you. All right, thank you for, for the question. I hope, uh, I hope you can get me clearly. Yeah, I can. Yes. Um, so uh, the 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 background in terms of um, how it was introduced, uh, um, it was introduced, I think, uh, uh, un un unintentionally. Or that's, I don't know. I don't know how to say whether it is intentional or unintentionally, but basically, how it was introduced was during a construction of um, a road which was being done across the floodplain. So the the, the 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 constructors of the of that road decided to uh, dig a pond and start rearing uh, crayfish for 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 consumption, but unfortunately, uh, when the flood came, um, the the flood was so high that it flushed out uh, the, the the crayfish onto the flood plain, and then since then they have um, uh, uh, they have been spreading uh, uh, across the flood plain. So in terms of uh, management, um, uh, I mean, in terms of avoiding future introduction, I think one of the things that perhaps needs to be done, and, and this is one of the, um, the things that uh, my study will be looking into, uh, but perhaps is to look at the biosecurity, uh, to strengthen the biosecurity uh, measures in the country, because that looks to be the area of weakness, um, given the the increase in the number of introduction uh, of crayfish in the country, and not just crayfish, but uh, non-native species. Uh, I think the past 10 years, the uh, data shows that there's been an increase in the number of uh, introduction of um, non-native species uh, in aquatic uh, systems across the country. So I think uh, it would be a good point to start from there by reducing the number of, uh, by strengthening biosecurity uh, measures. Thank you. Um, I have another question from, for you from Taryn. Um, Say so it's great talk, Nawa. Do people eat this crayfish and are there currently eradication efforts in place? Um, thank you for the, for the question again. Um, actually, it, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it looks like some of, the, some of the questions that are coming are exactly some of the things that I'm trying to look at. So uh, in, in terms of uh, eating the crayfish, they, 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 at the moment, uh, they seem to be um, emerging markets for uh, crayfish. Uh, people have started realizing the economic value of uh, crayfish, but then these are just restricted to uh, a few, um, what I would call international hotels. As for the locals, they seem to have not uh, embraced um, the crayfish eating yet. Um, but I think uh, there is education going around to see whether that can be explored as, as a, a solution in terms of trying to uh, manage um, a crayfish population. Uh, so that would probably involve uh, encouraging people to harvest them. But again, that that's uh, that's another tricky area because they are, I think they need for a lot of education to avoid. Um, the, the, to avoid uh, the process of uh, removing them for, for selling, being a pathway again for further introduction into uh, other aquatic systems. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that, in that area. 
Oh, thank you so much, Nawa. Um, because of time, please just go through the chats. There's a few nice comments for you and some questions that you can answer directly to the people who ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then now we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Dolly Tibeti. My name is Dali Tiveri and I'm a master's student at the Northwest University. I am here to present my project titled The Historic Distribution of Biofalaria Fayfair in the Wembe District in the Limpopo Province. Bilharzia is a molluscan vector borne disease caused by a trematode parasite of the Schistosoma genus. The disease is prevalent in tropical and subtropical regions in sub Saharan Africa, including several provinces of South Africa. Figure 2 shows Limpopo and Pumalanga have the highest prevalence in South Africa, and Figure 3 shows that Limpopo has the highest distribution of Biofalaria fayfair in South Africa. The disease impacts rural areas more due to the lack of good sanitation, water access, and having fewer health facilities. Figure 1 shows a community in the Bembe district washing clothes near them. A study conducted for Limpopo Bembe district showed that females 10 to 20 years of age had higher rates of Bilhazia infections. Lipopo had a high prevalence in Bilhazia February 2000 and October 2003, which are months associated with high rainfall and temperature in the province. When drought occurred in the Membe district, Bilhazia prevalence decreased. However, when floods occurred, in, the prevalence increased. Biofalaria fever is responsible for 80% of Schistosoma mansoni infections in the Lipopo province. The optimum habitat preference of the Biomphalaria fairy was perennial, clear, standing fresh water with aquatic plant presence at muddy and stony substratum. The temperature preferred was 15 to 25 degrees Celsius at a rainfall of 600 to 900 millimeters. In the Limpopo province, 62 to 70% of school children sampled exhibited Bilhazia infections. Aquatic environments driven by bioclimatic and climatic changes allow intermediate host snails to survive, grow, and develop. High amounts of rainfall cause flooding, which invades the human population and increases the transmission of Bilhazia. Alternatively, when a drought occurred in South Africa between 2015 to the year 2017, a decrease in Bilhazia prevalence was then attributed to the dried up water bodies. South Africa's average annual temperature increased by 0.13 degrees Celsius, which varied in season from 1960 to 2003. The Maxon model is effective but has not been utilized in the Limpopo province. The justification. The results from the habitat preference will be useful for monitoring the potential shift in spatial range of the intermediate host snails. Modeling will assist in identifying current and future hotspot areas and identifying vulnerable areas will allow the launch of local programs to intervene in the communities. The aims and objectives. The aim is to determine the impact of climate variables on the suitable habitat and the distribution of Biofalaria fayfairy. The objectives are to characterize the historical suitable habitats of the Biofayfairy in the Wembe district, to determine the historical spatial distribution of the biofayfair using climate variables in the Wembe district, and to identify areas that are vulnerable to Bilhazia in the Wembe district. The study area. Figure four shows the Wembe district with the rivers and sampling points. The table shows the characteristics of the district, which has an area of 25,597 kilometers squared with a maximum temperature of 10 degrees Celsius in winter and 40 degrees Celsius in summer. The annual rainfall is 500 millimeter with 87.1% falling in October to March. The population is approximately 1.2 million people in which 55% of the population are females. The water source is rivers and borehole water. 7.4% of the population have access to piped water, 16% have access to flushing toilet, and 60.5% have access to waste removal weekly. Public health facilities available are 112 clinics, 6 district hospitals, and 29 mobile services. The biome found in this area is the savanna biome. The methodology for the first objective made use of the secondary data from the National Freshwater Snail Collection, the NFSC, from 1958 to 1964. 
The secondary data included habitat data such as plant, surface water, salinity percentage, water transparency, speed of water, substratum, water body, altitude, temperature, and rainfall. The effect size index finds the importance of each variable, how much variable contributes, and the analysis power. The decision tree is an algorithm used to identify patterns in the data sets. The results will include tables, graphs, and trees. The NFSC provided 612 biofiferry recorded snail species and era 5 land monthly average data provided climate and bioclimatic variables. Using secondary data from the NFSC and climatic and bioclimatic data, a principal component analysis, PCA, will be used to break down large data into smaller data. Multi-regression analysis will be done to show a relationship between dependent and independent variable. A Pearson correlation will be used to measure the strength of variables and as values ranging from negative one to a positive one. A Maxon model will be done and receiver operating characteristics, ROC, is a 2D plot that shows a curve used in identifying the AUC. 30% of the data will be used as test data and 70% will be used as training data. The jackknife test will be done. Objective 3 makes use of the Water Associated Disease Index to combine susceptibility data, which is the census data, and combines it with exposure, which is climatic data. The susceptibility data includes age groups, gender, access to water, population density, sanitation facility, settlement type, healthcare center, education, wealth index, and agricultural activities. As for objective one, the graphs show temperature and rainfall in the years 1958 to 1964. The data was further divided into 1958 to 1961 and 1961 to 1964. That is because there was missing data for 1961 and 1962. So this was done to show how the different years affect the suitable habitat. 1958 to 1961 recorded 148 biofilaria species and 1961 to 1964 recorded 464 biofilaria species. Overall, the data had 612 recorded snail species and showed a clear relationship between temperature and rainfall. The suitable habitats for the biofilaria fairy was found to be permanent, clear, standing fresh water located at dams with a muddy substratum and altitude 500 to 1000 meters, rainfall of 600 to 900 millimeters and temperature of 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. However, in 1958 to 1961, the water transparency was muddy instead of clear, which is because 53% of the data was uncategorized. The same is true for water speed in 1961 to 1964, which favors slow running instead of standing water. 30% of the data was uncategorized. 1961 to 1964 also added different results for temperature. This may be due to drought presence in the 1960s. These are the effect size results for objective one, showing that in 1958 to 1961, salinity had the highest effect size. However, in 1961 to 1964, as well as the overall data, 1958 to 1964, the water speed had the highest effect size. The surface water had the lowest effect size in all the years. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolly. Um, I just have one question. Um, one question for you. So I'm interested to know, in terms of moving forward in the implementation of the programs you mentioned, which are aimed at um, assisting the affected communities. Like, what's the progress, especially for the Limpopo community, which you identify as one of the most vulnerable? So, what's the progress in terms of implementing those programs in aiding those communities? Um, Ella, I didn't quite hear you. Can you repeat, please? Well, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, your work will also assist in the implementation of programs that are going to help vulnerable communities. And my question is, what's the way forward in terms of the implementation of those programs? Um, there are no programs 
because um, I'm just studying to show where the problem is so that the programs can be. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a question from Anthony Bernard. It says, great presentation, thank you. So excuse the ignorance, but what is the effects of Balhaiza on humans? That's the question for you. What is the effect of Belhazia on humans? Yeah, yeah Belhazia, it's, um, it's a disease. So it affects people by like, it makes them sick. I think that's the summary, it's a disease. Okay, thank you. Um, and then now for the freshwater ecology and biodiversity session, we will move on to our last speaker, which is Daniel Van Play. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel van Vlaag. I'm going to present a um, section of the results for my soon to be completed master's thesis. Amphibians of the world are in decline. Contributors to this decline includes the spread of infectious disease, habitat loss, and invasive species. Now, given their life history, amphibians are vulnerable to both aquatic and terrestrial invasions. A global review of the impact of invasive species on native amphibians reports plants to have a mean positive effect, whilst invertebrates are the most negative impacting taxa. This is largely attributable to the North American crayfish invasions across Europe. And although these crayfish are really bad, invasive fish occupy a wider range across more species with a richer history of introduction. One of the richest countries in the world, at least in invasive fish, is South Africa. 55 species have been introduced with at least 44 successfully establishing. These include the highly impactful salmonids and centrocids. Continuous introductions mainly occur for sport fishing with the most common sites being headwater streams. But these headwater streams are home to an endemic family of amphibians known as the heliophrynids or the ghost frogs. We have seven species of ghost frog found along the escarpment from the Western Cape to KwaZulu-Natal. Their tadpoles can spend up to two years in the larval stage and are easily recognized by their dorsolaterally flattened bodies and large oral suckers, which they use to feed on algae and to cling to the rocks in the fast flowing water. This permanence of flow and low temperature has been identified as key habitat descriptors for the table mounted ghost frog tadpole. Given their unique life history and specialist habitat requirements, two of these species are listed as critically endangered and endangered respectively. So we have headwater streams with endemic amphibians and invasive fish now occupying those streams. So is there an impact? Well, two studies have looked at the impact of invasive fish on ghost frog tadpoles, both reporting significant negative effects. Sites were compared above and below waterfalls. Now we know that not all streams will have these natural dispersal barriers and deliberate introductions are occurring above these dispersal barriers. So the aim of my study was to investigate these impacts across a much broader scale. To achieve that, I sampled tadpole abundance of heliophrine Pacelli and Regis across 112 sites in 26 streams of the Western Cape. Tadpoles were sampled manually during time-limited intervals whilst fish um, <clears throat> sampling involved electrofisher being used to determine the presence of invasive fish. I also recorded important water quality parameters and physical site features to determine the, or to account for the effect of the environment and habitat on the observed tadpole abundance. To analyze these effects, I fitted the sampled variables to the dependent variable of tadpole abundance in a generalized linear mixed model. The results are summarized in the forest plot or blobogram. I decided on this figure for today's talk since it is the most descriptive for all the variables in the model. The 
vertical horizontal, um, sorry, the vertical hyphenated line represents the null uh, effect line. To the left of the line is a negative effect and to the right is a positive and a significant effect will not cross the line of null effect. So the red asterisk will help us see that invasive fish, pH, temperature, oxygen, depth, and certain vegetation types have significant effect on tadpole abundance. In terms of the direction, invasive fish seem to negatively impact them. The re relationship with pH implies that acidic waters are favored by um, tadpoles. Temperature is an unexpected result in the positive direction. Oxygen saturation is, as expected, um, a positive effect. The stream depth implies that deeper streams are associated with a decrease in tadpole abundance. And uh, the last three lines are two way comparisons between uh, pairs of the three vegetation types recorded in the study. So there are significantly more um, tadpoles associated with fynbos and indigenous forest when compared to plantations. Now I can conclude from the results that invasive fish have significant negative impacts on ghost frog tadpoles, but the effect of the environment cannot be overlooked. Now these effects likely have implications to ghost frog conservation, but what are they? Well, this study does not contribute enough to imply conservation um, actions, but I want to highlight a publication from 2004 that reports less than 3% of conservation decisions were based on primary scientific literature. Common sense, which we all know is decreasingly common, was used for the most decisions being made. If we take that anecdotal approach of common sense and apply it to, for example, the eradication of fish with the aim of ghost frog conservation, money and time will be wasted if the targeted sites are not suitable habitat. So with the evidence-based approach in mind, how do we approach in the context of invasive fish and ghost frogs? Unfortunately, more information is needed from both sides. From the amphibian side, the evidence buildup could be used to motivate a reassessment of the conservation status of certain species, given that the two species I sampled are listed as least concern and um, there is a large extent of fish invasion in their distribution ranges. And that could be used to update their occurrence records and also large scale evaluation of habitat suitability and monitoring, monitoring that over time will be useful in delineating sites of high priority and also the expansion of protected area. On the invasive fish side, a broad scale example would be collaborative collaborating and adding data to a centralized database like FBIS, and on the finer scale to isolate the interaction between frog and fish um, investigate the mechanism. Instead of seeing this as an insurmountable gap between today and conservation decision-making, I propose we see it as an opportunity for future research. I'd like to thank my collaborators on screen um, Josie Pegg in particular, and you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was a really interesting um, presentation. I like the fact that uh, in addition to just understanding the invasive species impact, you also look at what the environment is doing to the um, ghost frogs. But I, I think I might have missed this. Maybe you mentioned it in your presentation. Which specifically, which invasive fish did you look at? I might have missed that part. Um, no, you didn't miss that part. I just didn't mention it. We um, we couldn't really find enough centralized data to determine uh, the true distribution of species. So we had to determine the presence of invasive fish in the field. Uh, the invasive fish species that we encountered were the majority were uh, rainbow trout, and then one section had uh, brown trout, and um, we also found some extra limital uh, tilapia as well. But majority were were trout. Okay, well, thank you. Um, 
you can just check the um the chats there's some nice comments for you hey um that's it from me i'll hand off to hand over to our next chair which is samantha Thank you, Nobuhle. Uh, everyone, I'm Samantha Okes, and I'll be chairing the session of Invertebrate and Novel Biology and Ecology. Um, we have a total of four talks, very interesting talks. Um, just a reminder to everybody, uh, if you have questions, just type it in the chat box, or you can raise your hand at the end of each session. Our first speaker for this session is Sipalele Diante. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sipinele Dianke, and I'll be presenting on my PhD project entitled The Role of Nature-Based Eco-Engineering Structures on Early, on Early Stage Invertebrates and Fish, a Complexity, Soundscape, and Physiological Perspective. Coastal environments are productive and diverse ecosystems which facilitate key ecological functions. These ecosystems undergo multiple changes which can vary at a patch level. This leads to increased complexity, which generally increases biodiversity, as shown in the pictures in the corners of the screen. Overall, this complex configuration helps maintain populations of marine benthic organisms in coastal ecosystems. Now, why are these coastal habitats important? They provide structural and surface complexity, which gives rise to a variety of habitats, such as nursery and spawning grounds, and also microhabitats, which are critical for early life stages of animals, which then, therefore, generally increases biodiversity. They provide unique sound signatures, and sound is important for animals by way of communication, orientation to suitable habitats, describing the quality of the environment and helps in detection of prey and or predators. Finally, they provide a thermal refuge as several marine organisms are ectotherms and therefore are dependent on the environment for survival and development through the early life stages. The rationale behind the study is that coastal urbanization is increasing. This leads to expansion of coastal infrastructure, such as Gabion seawalls, jetties, breakwaters, and therefore a rise in placement of natural habitats. Coastal infrastructure can give rise to an artificial habitat. However, artificial habitats are not the same as natural habitats. And by that, I mean in terms of material, physical chemical properties, microbiome and ecology. It seems as though ecological engineering is a viable option to address negative impacts linked with coastal infrastructure. Now, what is ecological engineering? It combines ecological knowledge and, and engineering practices to enhance, restore, or rehabilitate biodiversities in areas where natural habitats have been or are in the process of being transformed. Now, there are three types of ecological engineering. There's hard, there's soft, and there's hybrid. Hard ecological engineering entails modifying existing structure or coming up with novel designs, such as the picture in the top right-hand corner. Soft engineering entails rearranging existing infrastructure or reverting back to what was there before the infrastructure was built. And finally, hybrid takes an approach of combining nature with existing or novel infrastructure. And that is the approach that this project will take. My study is under the bigger project called the Indigenous Marine Innovations for Sustainable Environments and Economies, in short, EMISI. And the main aim of this project is to co-develop innovative nature-based eco-engineered structures with the Kaiskammer Trust, an organization based in the rural town of Hamburg. And the plant Cyperis 
pixtilis, which is on the right hand side of the screen, also known as EMEs, will be used to create the structures. Now, when these created structures are made, they will potentially enhance the quality of urban coastal habitats for early life stages of invertebrates and fish. My aim of my project is to use these nature-based structures in urban and natural coastal areas to determine the structural complexity, characterize the soundscapes, and to assess the fitness, in this case, physiology, for early life stages of invertebrates and fish. My study sites are located in the Eastern Cape, but they comprise of two natural sites, Cannon Rocks, Guinea Bay, two big harbors, Port of Mocha and Port of Elizabeth, and two small harbors, Port Alfred Marina and Port of St. Francis. My first objective, complexity, is to measure the three dimensional complexities of the various nature based structures. 3D scanned models of the structures will be made using an Xbox Kinect version 2. Multiple metrics will be used to assess the scans, and then potential changes over time will be tracked, that is to say, before, during, and after deployments. My second objective, soundscapes, entails recording and characterizing ambient sound in natural and urban sites. I will develop a low-cost hydrophone, such as an example on the top right hand corner. I will test this hydrophone through 24-hour sample trials and also fine-tune it. This will help in determining sample times that I will be interested in, such as night, day, and morning and spring tide type, new or full moon. I will then record the ambient sound in the natural and artificial, and then characterize the soundscape. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen, as I will not present my preliminary results on the soundscapes, as I am still currently busy in analyzing my trial recordings from the field. My third objective will be to assess the physiology of larval fish and invertebrates by measuring the metabolic oxygen consumptions of different early stages. Fish and invertebrate larvae will be collected with a light trap, such as the picture shown on the top right hand corner. The larvae will be transported and acclimated in aerated filtered seawater at collection temperature. Larva will then be sorted according to species and octogeny using a dissecting microscope. And then the experiments will be conducted using a pre-sense 24 chambers sensor dish reader and a parasite's fasting O2 for invertebrate and fish larvae respectively, as shown in the two pictures below. My expected outcomes for this study are to develop a low-cost hydrophone and also to add relevant information in ecological engineering at the microscope scale level I will be investigating. In this case, structurally, referring to the complexity formation over time, functionally how these structures may potentially enhance the environment, which will have an effect on the physiology of the larvae that will live in and around the nature-based structures, and physically, on the potential soundscapes that may emanate from the nature of these structures. In addition, this kind of research in the South African context is still rare and is mostly found in other regions of the world, such as the United States, the, in Europe, and also in Australia. I would like to acknowledge the following organizations who are part of this big and beautiful project. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you, um, Sipilele, for a very interesting talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, for just interest, I might have missed it in your talk. Um, you mentioned larvae. Um, is there any specific sort of species you'll be looking at? Or is this whatever you'll be collecting? Uh, morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Um, there's no specific um, larvae that we'll be looking for. So we'll be looking for the larvae that will be predominant, that will be collected in the light traps. So it's a matter of chance and what we find um, in the light traps. Hence, when I collect them and I have to sort and see what, do I, what am I actually getting before I even attempt to um, run the experiment. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Pedro. A really nice talk, Sipalile. You are analyzing the sounds now. Do you have any library database to help you in identifying, filtering, interpreting the sounds? Um, to answer that question, um, uh, there's a collaborator who is helping me um, um, from Stellenbosch University, um, Simon Owen. Um, so there are databases of um, sound um, in terms of different fish and other um, animal species. So that's what I'm trying to kind of learn and see or what from the trial data that I, I have and see what have I picked up and tried to match. So there is a bit of hope, but yeah, so but it's, it's still currently in the process. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question from Nicola. Hi, Sipilele, great talk. Can you give some examples of the complexity in the indices you will measure? Uh, complexity indices could include things such as um, surface rugosity, um, the curvature, the slope, um, and even perhaps the depth of the, um, the structures themselves, you know, over time when we put these um, nature-based structures. So those are some of the um, indices that I'll be looking into. Obviously, there's way more in terms of literature, but I'll have to determine which ones would be important, especially for the scale that we're looking at with this um, microscope. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. We still have most time. Ah, very nice talk, Sipalele. Um, we can probably move on to the next if there's not any more questions. Um, our next speaker will be Lubekhle Mufadza. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Unubu Shembanda. This presentation is an overview of my PhD project, which is looking at how nature-based ecological engineering can be used together with indigenous knowledge and practices to enhance the biodiversity of urban coastal communities in terms of early life staging. So firstly, it is very important to note that the coastal ecosystems provide a number of goods and services that are beneficial to both mankind and animals. So when it comes to people, they play a crucial role in food security and in boosting the country's economy through re recreation and tourism, as well as um, through trade networks. These ecosystems are known to be one of the most productive natural ecosystems on earth. They are highly complex in structure with a diverse range of ecologically important microhabitats. And these microhabitats serve crucial necessary functions for juvenile fish and they act as safe havens um, for early life stages, which are vulnerable to predation and other environmental stresses. Although there are all these important roles played by coastal ecosystems, they are unfortunately subjected to a number of anthropogenic pressures that lead to habitats loss as natural habitats are being replaced by man-made artificial infrastructures for coastal development. So coastal developments, although beneficial to humans, they are unfortunately a major threat to coastal communities as they lessen the structural complexity of coastal habitats and that's a loss of crucial microhabitats for species. And this leads to the alteration of species interactions and distribution and which eventually results in an overall decline of biodiversity. So because um, of all this, mention anthropogenic pressures, there is a need to jumpstart the recovery process of these habitats 
in order to um, counteract the impact caused by um, urbanization. So one way to do this is to use ecological engineering to improve the value of coastal habitats by complexifying the um, infrastructure with the aim of enhancing the biodiversity and value um, of coastal areas. This is done by adding structures that species can attach to or drilling into substrates creating crevices and ledges in order to complexify urbanized habitats. And by doing so, we are creating these ecologically important microhabitats for species. So basically, um, ecological engineering um, mimics the natural environment with the sole aim of restoring impacted ecosystems. So my research takes a nature-based approach of ecological engineering where we are using a plant known as Cyperus textatilis, which is commonly known in Mississippi as it easy to make nature-based structures in order to improve necessary function, settlement success, and the recruitment of um, invertebrates. So the Imizi is traditionally used to weave sitting mats, sleeping mats, bags, um, and baskets, just to name a few. So my nature-based structures will be made using this traditional weaving skills and designs. So the aim of my research is to combine um, combine nature-based ecological engineering with indigenous knowledge and practices in order to enhance the biodiversity of, of urban habitats along the south key, um, southeast coast of South Africa, and mainly looking at level um, early, life, early life stages in terms of level assemblages, settlement and recruitment, as well as um, species diversity. Um, my study sites are separated into three categories. We have small harbors, which is Port of Red Marina and Port of St. Francis. We have large harbors, which is Port of Nuha and Port of, Port of Port Elizabeth. And then we have natural sites, which is Cannon Rocks and um, Kili Bay. So all the selected sites are within the same marine bioregion in order to account for the occurrence of similar benthic coastal community. My first objective, which is currently ongoing with field work and um, analysis of samples, is to test and validate the efficiency of two light trap designs in order to assess whether different designs can be deployed um, at either the natural or urban sites. And once I have my results from this pilot study, it will feed into my first objective, which assesses special invertebrate larval assemblages in both urban and natural sites using light traps. And then the hypothesis for this is that there is no difference in species composition and um, composition and abundance between urban and natural coastals. The second objective is to enhance the um, natural function for fish larvae, the recruitment success for invertebrates and coastal habitats by increasing habitat complexity through nature-based ecological engineering. And then the hypothesis is that the amazing nature-based structures will increase habitat complexity, thus increasing the necessary function, settlement, and recruitment. And my last objective is to assess and improve intertidal biodiversity and coastal habitats by monitoring a short-term succession using nature-based amazing structures the hypothesis for this is that immediate structures will increase species diversity in both the urban and natural sites. And then we have a different treatments here where we find and um, we hypothesize that complex immediate structures will have greater species diversity than simple immediate structures. So our nature-based structures are co-created by SIAP and the Gaze Gamma Trust um, community. And a crucial component in the creation of the structures is the cultural indigenous knowledge, of course, that the Gaze Gamma um, Trust holds in terms of where do we harvest Demisi and how do we sustainably harvest Demisi. So they show us where to cut and then we cut and then bring it to them. And then they're responsible for the drying of the Demisi um, structures and then also making the actual structures. To address objective one, I'm looking at species assemblages. As I've mentioned, I have a pilot objective first. So the current ongoing work is a pilot methodology study where I'm looking at testing the efficiency of two light traps. So the sampling for this is currently ongoing um, with the aim of completing it in December. The pilot study is important as some of the environments that we're working on are highly bettered by waves. 
So to avoid ex expenses, the plan is to use the cheaper, easy to make cylindric um, cylindrical design at the natural side, and then use the more expensive one at the urban side. And then, and then my findings from the pilot study will feed into um, the level distribution, level assemblages um, objective, where light traps will be de um, deployed at both urban and natural sites and will be deployed at dusk during a low tide and retrieved the following morning. These light traps um, specifically target phototactic um, species. And then once the samples are retrieved, they're preserved in ethanol, um, ethanol for later processing. The samples are then sorted and the larvae are counted and then identified to the lowest um, taxon level possible to assess the differences in species com um, composition and abundance for both natural and urban sites. And then secondly, I will be using small EMEZI, um, small 10 by 10 EMEZI structures um, to assess the recruitment and settlement of these structures. Then I also have controls where um, there will be just a cleared natural substrates that has been I'm cleared of any biofilm or invertebrates or life on it. And then the structures will be deployed and collected monthly um, during the spawning period, which is October to May. And then the whole structure is re retrieved and taken back to the lab for species identification in order to assess whether the immediate structures are actually improving necessary function, take limit and recruitment. And then lastly, I'll be looking at a short-term successional monitoring study of uh, diversity where I am using larger 30 by 30 centimeter emesis structures with different treatments. So we have a complex treatment where we have muscles attached to the structure. We have a simple um, treatment without the muscles and we have a control, which is clearings of um, the natural substrate. And then these will also be deployed at both urban and natural sites. So this will be done for a period of six months. So where I'll be coming in um, monthly to directly count what's on the, um, the structures, but also take images per month of whatever is accumulating on the structures. And then diversity estimates will be done at the end of the mo um, monitoring period. The expectations for this research is that the nature-based structures will increase the level of our diversity and will also increase the functionality of coastal habitats and the establishment success of species. And because this is a collaborative work between researchers and indigenous knowledge holders, we will also be able to recognize and value the role of rural communities and their indigenous knowledge. And while um, the community is making the structures, they're also getting compensated. So in the long run, we're also um, creating economic empowerment for this rural community. Lastly, thank you to SIAP for funding my research and all port access authorities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, for a very nice talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Oh, Edna Bukhle, is there any way to validate that the pre-urbanized condition of the currently urbanized sites had higher abundance, abundances? Than they do now, etc. Maybe Port Alfred has always had low abundances even before the marina was built on top of it. Um, as far as I know, I haven't come across anything in terms of that, but because my work looks at natural sites and um, the urban sites, are we able to compare between? Um, what's occurring on a naturally unimpacted site and then the ebonized sites. I don't know if that's answering the question. Uh, Godfrey, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Um, the next question from Nicola. So do you have any vegetated natural sites like sea grouse bed? No, no, no. We looking, we have Kinney Bay and Cannon Rocks, which we are looking at gullies and rock pools. So there is not much vegetation of um, sea, bra um, sea beds where we are actually deploying our light traps or um, our mats. Most of the sites we're looking at have um, mussels around or close to. Thanks. Oh, sorry, there's another question. 
Sipilile. Aina Bukhle, thank you for the great talk. Can you mention any differences between the two designs of light traps in terms of functionality, extra collection of larvae and or design durability since your last trial in the field? Hmm. So I've, I've been fortunate to have finished my sampling for the trial studies of the two designs. And what I've been noticing throughout the sites is um, the quadrifold design is more robust um, in terms of in, in cases of high wave action. So it's more robust. Whereas we were finding for the cylindrical design, we're finding that when we come back to retrieve, we might even not have any samples because there will be so much damage on the actual um body of the light trap that we lost the samples in it. But then in terms of the two, so far based on the trip that I've done throughout the sites, the quadrifold design has seemed to be, um, has proven to be more um, effective in terms of handling the environmental pressures. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Anthony Bernard. Great presentation, Lopefle. How long do the nature-based structures last? And if they disintegrate, how will this affect the inverts that settled on them? Okay. They last about six to seven months. So we have a postdoc in our group, in our music group, who's been doing durability work on the actual structures before we even um, decided on my um, time period for the biodiversity study. So they only last for six months, um, six to seven months, which is the reason why for my specific study, I've chosen to do my um, species biodiversity, or should I say succession for a period of six months. Okay, thanks. And then there's a question from Albert Anubukhle. Enjoy your talk. Any specific reasons for choosing Imiti? So I think I mentioned the traditional um, component of um, what the Imiti is used for, where they make the sleeping mats. So I think my supervisor will be the first person to answer this, but because of the design and the indigenous knowledge um, of um, how the structures are made, the traditionally known structures, we also took the same idea and implemented it into our own, um, our own image structures. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Ant, um, from Albert Axi, from Ant. Would ongoing harvesting not deplete the resource in the long term? No, definitely not. So we've we've been doing trips ourselves with the help of the Gays Gamma community. So we've been going to Hamburg um, and then the communities because they understand how to sustainably harvest the immediate stems. So they've been teaching us how to sustainably harvest them, where to cut, how to cut, how to dry. And yeah, so we're not really worried about any depletion of the resources in the long run because it's being sustainably harvested. State. Okay, thank you very much for your very nice talk. Um, thank you. Please check the chat box if there's more questions. And we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Jabalani Zaba. Morning. My name is Jabalani Zaba, and my presentation is titled Application of Ecological Engineering to Urban Coastlines Biofilm Diversity and Successional Changes. So coastal environments are transitional regions between the terrestrial land masses as well as the open oceans, which are generally characterized with diverse habitats, such as mangroves, coral reefs, seagrass meadows, as well as rocky shores, which accounts for the high species diversity along these habitats, as well as a high level of primary productivity, often seen through storage and recycling of nutrients and organic matter. So these coastal environments provide a wide range of ecosystem services, such as shoreline stabilization, biogeochemical cycling of trace elements and nutrients, which play an essential role in the reproduction of coastal fish and invertebrates. And lastly, provide an economic benefit to industry through storm protection and tourism. So coastal environments also consist of smaller habitats within the larger environment known as microhabitats which are generally composed of biofilms, uh, which are ubiquitous masses of microorganisms enclosed by an extracellular matrix. So biofilms uh, function as a primary sources in coastal environment by breaking down organic matter for assimilation of nutrients and trace elements to organisms. 
therefore supplying food to higher trophic levels and in a way function as a middleman in energy and nutrient flow and also function in mediating larval settlement through chemical cues. So true to the small scale size of these habitats and functional traits of biofilms, studies have found these habitats can be sensitive towards environmental changes. So in coastal environments, anthropogenic activities such as urbanization and industrialization have negative implications on coastal ecosystems. So for an example, the use of flat hardened structures and less complex structures such as jetties, breakwaters, quay walls, often seen in small harbors and in ports, results in the modification of natural intertidal and subtidal habitats. And these impacts are not only limited to habitat loss, but also to changes in water quality uh, through the introduction of municipal and industrial waste effluent containing heavy metals, trace elements, and inorganic nutrients. So these changes, in a way, have a domino effect, firstly, through the alteration of the chemical and physical stru structures of coastal environments, with impacts resulting in the reduction of habitat complexity and or habitat loss, followed by a reduction of species recruitment and overall a decline in species diversity and coastal ecosystem function. So when looking at the assessment between natural and artificial environment, it indicates a, an opposing direction rather than finding natural features that can be incorporated in urbanized regions with, with natural coastal environments indicating variable habitat complexity higher trophic, trophic resilience towards change, a greater number of native species and natural successional changes. As in contrast to urbanized coastal environments, it is generally observed with reduced habitat complexity, lower genetic diversity, and more opportunistic and invasive species, as well as a, a reduced level of bio, biological functionality, often seen through reproduction rates and poorer water quality. In order to improve and maintain coastal habitat function, there are eco ecologically engineered structures which are able to minimize or offset the effect caused by anthropogenic activities at small scale levels. So these eco-engineered structures are based on the sustainability and the use of ecologically friendly materials. The longevity of the prototype to have an impact on the environmental issue to be addressed and also provide an integration between urbanized regions with its natural environment. So these structures provide, a, provide an alternative habitat for organisms that are found around these environments as these structures mimic natural features such as rock pools, fish species to recruit during low tide, crevices, holes, as well as rougher surfaces for the attachment of biogenic species such as mussels and algal biofilms. So given the anthropogenic footprint along our coastal regions, ecological solutions are necessary in order to maintain and improve coastal ecosystem functionality. So the present study aims to co-design and test nature-based structures in order to improve primary productivity and trophic resilience in urbanized uh, regions with focus to water quality measures, microbial assemblages, as well as tr the trophic ecology of early stage fish and invertebrates. So the objectives of the study are to number one, co-develop and test the nature-based uh, eco-engineered prototypes. Number two is to determine the chemical composition of water by quantifying the levels of metals and nutrients. Number three is to also characterize primary productivity and microbial and the microbial community on the nature-based prototypes. And number four is to determine the chemical composition of the biofilm on the nature-based prototypes. And number five is to determine the nitrogen and carbon isotope ratios of early stage invertebrates and fish that occur on the nature-based prototypes. And lastly is to conduct trial experiments in order to look at the biofilm successional changes and characterize food webs on these structures. So I therefore hypothesize that there will be an increase in biofilm composition and primary productivity near the deployed nature-based prototypes and that water quality parameters such as metals, nutrients, and chlorophyll A will be higher near urbanized substrata 
the near the nature-based prototypes. And lastly, is that the trophic dependence of early stage fish and, and invertebrates will reflect the stable isotope signatures on the nature-based prototypes. So the locality of the study is set on a total of six sites, with four sites uh, located along the anthropogenic footprint, namely Port Alfred Marina, Port of Noha, Port Elizabeth, and Port of St. Francis, and two natural rocky, rocky shore sites. So when we assess the general coastal engineering along these sites, we, we, we generally, it, it is generally composed of flat hardened structures such as brick sea walls, natural boulders, and reinforced concrete, which is indicative of a reduced habitat. So the proposed methods of the study is to, number one, uh, create a 30 by 30 and a 10 by 10 uh, structure. We will be looking at uh, species recruitment on these structures, as well as biofilm succession, as well as we'll be looking at seeding the structures with, with muscles and deploying the structures uh, along the six, six sides with five replicates of each design and a control per site. And we'll be conducting monthly observation during the reproductive season over a two year period. So for the water quality, we'll be looking to assess, we'll be looking to assess metals, chlorophyll A, nutrients, as well as physiochemical parameters following uh, these protocols. For the biofilm analysis, we'll be looking at uh, collect the, the collection of biofilm material and storing in 25% glue to aldehyde solution for laboratory analysis and characterizing the biofilm uh, community using microscopy and also characterizing primary productivity using the phytopan analyzer, as well as to determine the micronutrients such as uh, carbo carbohydrates, such as carbohydrates and looking at biological markers for environmental exposure. To characterize the food web dynamics near the prototypes, water will be collected to determine the ca carbon isotope ratios of particulate organic matter, and we also be collecting fish, early stage fish and invertebrate samples to determine the carbon nitrogen isotope ratios. So the study hopes to provide greener and a more nature-based adapted solution in urbanized coastal environments, and also to bridge the knowledge gap in, ecology, in ecological engineering by assessing functional traits uh, using a transdisciplinary approach, and also to promote the four principles of ecological uh, engineering, such as ecology, to improve trophic net networks, engineering by applying a, a nature-based material and involving society in the co-creation of these structures by using indigenous knowledge systems with people from the Kais Karma Trust, and lastly, to promote ecosystem services such as primary productivity. I'd like to thank these, uh, acknowledge the following institutions, References. Thank you. Thank you, Jabalani, for a very good talk. Um, I don't see any questions as yet. Just hold on. Yep. Oh, Gwen, from Gwyneth and Jabalani, have you considered using meta barcoding sequence analyses to identify bacterial? and micro eukaryotic communities in the biofilms? Oh, thank you, Gwyneth, for the question. Uh, yes, we've thought about using uh, DNA in order to look at the entire communities on the biofilm by looking at bacteria, uh, algae, diatome, in order to see any successional changes. But so far, we are concentrating on assessing uh, specifically diatoms using microscopes. Thanks. Uh, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Uh, anyway, very nice talk, Chabalani. Our next speaker, our last speaker for this session will be Suzanne redelin -Hays. Hello, and thank you for listening to my presentation today. I'll be giving an overview of my PhD project structure, which is on the ecology of sea urchins. Sea urchins belong to the class Echinoidea, kin to sea stars, brittle stars, 
sea lilies and sea cucumbers, all belonging to the phylum Echinodermata. Sea urchins are ecological indicators, indicating characteristics of their environment through their presence or their condition. They are also ecosystem engineers, changing their environment through graze feeding. These powerful herbivores can drastically change the seascape as can be seen here. On the left, we see a balanced ecosystem and on the right, the same seascape in a drastically altered state called an urchin barren. Sea urchins also change their environment through their introduction of nutrient and microbe rich fecal pellets. Sea urchin gonads, more appetizingly called uni, have long been a staple of the sushi industry, but is now also being used as an ingredient in custards, ice cream, and as a pizza topping. The bulk of uni is supplied by and used in the Northern Hemisphere, where Trypneusus gratilla is the urchin of choice. Sea urchins have been recognized as having potential in aquaculture in South Africa, and this species has garnered a lot of interest as a candidate species for the establishment of echinoculture in our country. My research proposes an holistic approach to determining population health. This information can be used in choosing the best population for sea urchin broodstock in the establishment of echinoculture and can be used to examine or determine ecological resilience of the species in the face of anthropogenically driven environmental changes like rising ocean temperatures, ocean acidification and pollution to name a few. As an example, for adult sea urchins, an increase in dissolved carbon dioxide was correlated with delayed gonad development and as a result delayed spawning, as well as the suppression of feeding rate. Larvae are affected by such conditions as well, resulting in delayed physiological responses alongside decreased digestive efficiencies. The aims of my project are therefore to determine if one, some genomic marker indicates sea urchin population health, which will be investigated in a phylogeographic study. Two, if there is a particular gut microbial community that indicates urchin population health, which will be investigated using a 16S rRNA genetic analysis protocol. Or three, if the phenotype of the urchin can be used as a proxy for population health, which will be determined through a morphometric study. All of these are to be used in identifying the healthiest wild sea urchin population, which may indicate ecological resiliency and or help develop health indexes that may be applied to other species for use in aquaculture. For my project, I collected Paracinus angulosus throughout its South African distribution. It's not an edible species, but I chose it for its cosmopolitanism. I collected 10 individuals from each of these 47 sites from four bioregions, namely the Namakwa, Southwestern Cape, Agullis, and Natal bioregions. Samples were stored in sterile absolute ethanol for transport to Syab, and except for processing, these samples have been kept in freezers. Chapter one explores the phylogeographic analysis. Phylogeography can be defined in a couple of ways, but the definition most pertinent to this study describes it as a field of study that attempts to tease apart relationships among individual genotypes within a species or within a group of very closely related species and then correlate those relationships with their spatial distribution. I will be doing this using single nucleotide polymorphism analysis or SNPs. This focuses on the difference in the DNA on the scale of individual base pairs. In preparation for this chapter, I extracted DNA from tissue samples and produced copies of the DNA strands using PCR or polymerase chain reaction. EasyRAD, a protocol not before implemented at SIAB, is more flexible than other RAD-seq methods because a wider range of restriction enzymes can be used in the protocol and most importantly, it can be applied to non-model organisms such as sea urchins. Therefore, I have decided to use this RAD-seq protocol. Finally, the samples will be sequenced using MySeq sequencing which provides 200 million base pair reads to be used in the comparison between individuals and bioregions in the hopes of finding variations between individuals and bioregions. 
Chapter two studies the gut microbial community of the sea urchin, which is key in maintaining the health of the host organism through the facilitation of nutrient uptake. I focused on the 16S gene, which is most often used in bacterial work, specifically on the fourth and fifth hypervariable regions, where differences or mutations, such as they may be, are most likely to occur. As before, DNA was extracted and amplified and sequenced using MySeq sequencing. Analysis for this chapter includes investigation on broad and smaller scales, such as regional and intersite and intrasite respectively, as well as analysis into the taxonomy of taxa. Results from an anosome on 20 identified bacterial phyla yielded no significant effect of bioregion on the broad scale analysis, with intersite and intrasite results pending. A PCO plot of the different bioregions showed no clusters. Chapter three investigates the morphometry of the species, which describes the process of taking and comparing measurements of the dimensions of the external shape of, in this case, an organism. Lab work included the dissection of urchins to remove the Aristotle's lantern, which is the mouth structure for later processing, as well as the careful removal of spines, tube feet, and pedicellaria, which are stalked jaw-like pincers used for the handling of food items or detritus, which the tube feet can hold over the urchin as a primitive kind of camouflage. As the feeding organ, measurements of the mouth are critical, as are measurements of the pedicellaria as handling organs and tube feet as locomotory organs. Such measurements include the dimensions of the Aristotle's lantern, counts and categorization of pedicellaria, and counts of tube feet. Other characteristics measured include spine width, length, and counts, shell height and width, the width of the peristomal or mouth opening, urchin wet mass, the number of plates in the interambulacral zones, and the dimensions of each of the five individual teeth that make up the lantern, to name a few, which totals to more than 3,000 measurements per urchin. Proposed analyses include a PCA to reduce the number of variables in the data set, followed by Permanova to compare groups. And that brings us neatly to the conclusion. Since the results of the three chapters are so different in nature, I won't speculate or try to extrapolate from the results of the bacterial study. What I can say is from an ecological resilience perspective, information gleaned from this thesis informs on present distribution ranges of Parachinus angulosus, as well as all its associated gut microbial species, which may be used as a reference point in the future. All this information also, of course, informs on the best population from which to collect broodstock for Paracarnus angulosus, but it is toxic and so inedible. The intention behind this thesis is to develop a health index for use on other species, edible included, of sea urchin using a comprehensive protocol that looks at distribution range, gut microbiota, and phenotype. I would like to thank the following people for their assistance in the field, lab, or office, and hereby acknowledge the funders that funded this work. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Suzanne, for that good talk. Um, there's a question from Nicola. When do sea urchins pose a threat to help to kelp forest, and are they a problem in South Africa kelp forests? Thanks for your question, Nicola. So they become an issue when there is a proliferation and over proliferation of them. So as we've seen on the coast of California where otters were hunted for their pelts and otters being natural predators of sea urchins, with, uh, with the disappearance of otters, there were obviously more urchins, which were, there was more intense um, grazing pressure. And so kelp forests were grazed out of existence as in one of the slides. That's not really an issue here. Um, so I don't, okay, I don't, don't quote me on this, but my logic tells me that there isn't a risk of that happening in South Africa, simply because we don't hunt any of or overfish any of their predators to the point where 
the urchins are getting out of control. Okay, thanks. Not a question from Carla, just a comment. I tasted a sea urchin once, and let's just say that I don't recommend it. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> from Santal, Suzanne, nice talk. Just curious, what makes an urchin, urchin edible or versus inedible? So it's to do with um, toxins basically in their tissues. So Paracanus angulosa is my study species. It actually has a toxin in it, which is possibly why they are so, um, why the distribution is so wide. So it's literally down to having toxins in their tissues. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Um, if there's any more questions, maybe you should just check, check in the comments. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. For that nice talk. We've come to the end of our first session, or oh, second session. Oh, sorry, there is exit. Oh, to God. Um, our, our, our second session, um, we'll be breaking for tea um, and then come back at 11. Thank you.